Welcome, everyone. I'm Eva Ponce, Executive Director of the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management. And it's truly my pleasure to host this event where we, we will be discussing with Professor Yossi Sheffi about the critical role of supply chains in business and society. Dr. Yossi Sheffi is the Lisha Gray Professor of Engineering Systems at MIT, where he serves as the director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. He's an expert in many different areas, but more specifically in systems optimization, risk analysis, and supply chain management, of course. He's the author of many scientific publications and nine books. It's truly a pleasure to have you today, Yossi. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Excellent. So during this live event, Professor Sheffi and I will be discussing the critical role of supply chains in modern societies, in modern global economy, for about 30 minutes. Then I will open the floor during 15 minutes for questions from you, from the audience. So please make sure that you use the Q&A feature in the webinar. So we can, uh, I can see the questions and bring these questions to Professor Sheffi and answer the, your questions at, towards the end of the, this event. The plan for this event is to discover how supply chain management plays a crucial, a critical role in almost every aspect of business. So my first question for you, Yossi, is, why is it important to learn about supply chains? Well, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I, I think people, maybe, maybe people asked this question before the pandemic. I don't think too many people asked this question after the pandemic because we found out that as consumer, people in business always knew, but the consumer found out how important supply chains are for sustaining life, for bringing food, for bringing medicine, as well as uh, you know, uh, furniture and toys and everything else that you can imagine. So supply chain actually support not only sustaining life, but support standard of living. Mm -hmm. And the difference between countries with high standard of living and countries that standard of living is not that high is supply chain efficiency in many, many cases. So it's uh, also the difference between companies who do well and companies who don't do so well. Because supply chain is responsible for having the items on the shelf, for having the items in the fulfillment center, for having the item get to your home, having the item be at the pharmacy, at the hospital, um, in the supermarket. And uh, when supply chain, when, when supply chain are being hampered and not allowed to work as they usually do with the usual efficiency, uh, we have disruptions and we have shortages like we had during the pandemic. Yes, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for, for that because uh, it's true, it's, it's, the, the supply chain is kind of the backbone of these modern societies, uh, helping uh, everyone to get any goods. And you mentioned many different goods. Vaccines was one of those, uh, of medicines, toys, all of these goods. Um, um, you also mentioned the disruption, the pandemic. Um, it's true that um, supply chain are interconnected systems and complex systems. And during the last, I would say, 30, 50 years, we have been observing many disruptions, many, many reasons that are kind of bringing complexity to this supply chain. And the pandemic was one of these big, big disruptions, of course. So um, can you illustrate or bring some, some examples of these aspects that you think are kind of bringing more and more complexity to the supply chains? Well, uh... Interesting, you mentioned it in my latest book. I talk a lot about it, trying to explain to the uninitiated, to people who are not in supply chain, how complex and how intricate global supply chains are, and how many entities and people and organizations and private, public, NGO are involved in getting a product. Think about it from the mine, taking the basic material, or from the field when, when we grow them to a finished product. Uh, so, in the book, for example, I follow a t-shirt. What happened to a t-shirt 
from the, and this does not even include all the processes from the cotton to the textile. But once you have a t-shirt, just to get it to the consumer, you see how many people, organization processes are, in, are involved in this. And the, traditionally, the role of um, supply chain um, was mostly high level of service, which means try to maximize revenue and reduce cost. Mm -hmm. This was complex enough. Be running it over a huge network over the entire world, crossing borders, crossing different um, legal regime, different di different regulatory regimes. Uh, this was complex enough in its own right. Now supply chain are expected, and not only expected, the only way you can achieve new goals like resilience, like the ability to withstand disruption, we talk, we talk about some disruption, is by uh, strengthening supply chain or working in a different way in, in supply chain management. So regardless of the disruption, be it, you know, uh, Fukushima earthquake and radioactive disaster or, uh, you know, Katerina in the United States, BP explosion in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, many, many fires now in, uh, in California. Uh, floods in Europe. There are many, many disruptions all, all over the world. And um, so being able to withstand it and keep the flow of goods to, uh, to, uh, to consumers. A crucial new, again, another new uh, goal in the last 10 years is sustainability. Mm -hmm. it's, um, people, many people make mistakes by judging how sustainable, how green is a given company. That's almost meaningless because a company can outsource its um, dirty manufacturing operations to a country when there are when the regulations are not that tough, when labor issues are not are not a problem. So you can have a problem both with environmental sustainability and social justice by just by reorganizing your supply chain so you don't have to worry about what the EU thing with the US thing and, and uh, other country, but go to country when they don't pay attention to this. So mm -hmm. in order to judge supply chain on many, many uh, grounds, you have, in order to judge companies, you have to look at the supply chain. Looking, for example, at how green a particular company is, is basically meaningless. You have to look at the entire process of getting from the mine or the field to the consumer, to the supermarket, to the home, whatever it is, what is involved in, uh, in all of this? Are and people anywhere in the supply chain using child labor? Hmm. People anywhere in the supply chain using forced labor? Are people anywhere in the supply chain polluting the local rivers? Are people you know, uh, emitting CO2 in, uh, in large quantities? Where it happened in the supply chain? And so you have to look at the entire process. The basic approach at MIT in the, in the MicroMaster is understanding the system and, mm -hmm. and the system view of, of company operations. So you understand where the problems are, where the opportunities are as well, because we are focusing on problem, but there are also opportunities along the supply chain to make the entire chain more efficient, serve customer better, more sustainable, whatever. Yeah. So this is a big, a big opportunity and an interesting Topic, of I, I'm glad you mentioned this, um, the, the important role, not only the supply chain, the end-to-end -end supply chain, they understand to the entire system. And this is one of the key things when uh, I'm, I'm uh, hearing from our learners in the MicroMaster Program in Supply Chain Management, one of the things that they gain because they are exposed to the fundamental concepts in supply chain. So they are able to study about inventory management, transportation management, global supply chains. And at the end of the program, they are able Able to connect the dots and this this dot connection this overall view of the entire supply chain is one of the beautiful thing i think that the micromaster program supply chain management is bringing to the society and to the, to the world which is a uh, yeah great so uh, you mentioned the critical role you mentioned many many different important aspects i'm going to try to deep dive in some of those uh, regarding the critical role of that supply chains um, play in climate change. 
Um, you, you mentioned this importance of uh, the environmental impact of products end to end. Um, for example, electric vehicles uh, is, is a good example that we not we not only need to to look at the end of the supply chain and how this is contributing to less CO two emissions. We also need to look at the uh, uh, combust uh, the, the the initial part of the process, isn't it? So we 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 need to cover the 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 entire process, the manufacturing process, the origin of that product, and not see all only the the end of that application. Correct? As well, the, as, yeah. as, well as well as where the electricity is coming from, because if exactly. the electricity is coming from uh, uh, fossil fuel, well, that, exactly. that that is not you don't get as much savings as as you think you get and uh, in countries where you can use renewables or you can use actually uh, nuclear power then it makes a lot more sense yes uh, yeah there's, so, so there's also there's also there are also economic issues in general when you talk about when you talk about the, the ev when people think that the ev are not polluting will they drive more Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's just uh, this is a phenomenon that's well known. When people buy cars that are less, uh, that are more efficient in terms of the use of gas, they actually drive more because it's cheaper. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of things to think about when you think about the entire system. Exactly. And all of the implications that are, are uh, intricate on that. Um, and, and another um, aspect I want to touch here, talking about sustainability and this approach, is the role of technology. Uh, how do you see technology as a, playing a key role when we are talking about sustainability? Because you also you also touch not only the environmental sustainability, also social sustainability and economic sustainability. So the, these three aspects. How do you see technology helping here, Josie? Okay, that's that's a really uh, we need more time to <laughs> uh, to look at it because I think in some sense that's not the most important question. The most important question may be: Will people accept? You know, if people will be willing to pay a little more for sustainable product. And so mm -hmm. far, despite all the talk and the teenage girls from Sweden, it is not, people are not willing to pay more, by and large, in large numbers. There's always, you know, a minority that's an environmental minority that's willing to, willing to, uh, to pay more. But by and large, people don't. And, and, and business knowledge. So it's hard for companies to invest. It's hard for even government to set uh, to set regulation, even though people are trying for sure. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, a, of technology, there's some interesting way to think about it. For example, when we think about trucking, it turns out that uh, autonomous trucking will have a most likely a higher um, green impact than electric trucks because mm -hmm. autonomous because as it turns out uh, 30 or 40 percent of the fuel used by trucks is used for the benefit of the driver when the driver has to sleep in the truck when the driver just has to uh, cool and, and 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 warm the uh, um, uh the cab once there'll be autonomous trucks we don't have to worry about making the driver meal, uh, feel comfortable so there'll be a big um benefit in terms of uh, uh, emissions. Now, uh, if you combine, of course, electric plus, uh, plus autonomous, it may be even, even bigger. But as you mentioned before, electric vehicles, one has to look at the entire system, not just at, uh, you know, even at things like, I was just came back from London and uh, some of the cabbies are worried about Uber introducing autonomous hmm. cabs. Yes. And the question is, okay, let's say we have autonomous cabs and they will they will be cheaper because there will be no driver, but will there be a lot more trips because of autonomous cabs? Will there be a lot more congestion because of autonomous cabs? There's there so many impacts. We know, for example, when something becomes cheaper, it is used more. Yeah. Uh, just demand supply. So yes. uh, it's again we come back to the system aspect how will the technology what impact the technology um, will have I, I look 
the art technology, like uh, the renewables, are an important technology. Yeah. We have uh, wind or sun power. Uh, you know, these are technological breakthroughs that uh, mm -hmm. now become cheaper and cheaper, and then we can use them more and more. But they have inherent flaws. They cannot provide what's called base load. They can provide because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. So it comes and goes. And we need what's called base load that is there all the time because you don't want to get your car into a charging station and then the charging station doesn't work. Because it, yeah. it, and, and, and by the way, we see it. We see it in California today. California mm -hmm. today has brownouts, cases when there's no electricity for homes. And, and because they, they invested a lot in uh, um, in renewable and shut down a lot of nuclear plants, so there, there's no reliable energy. Yeah. So, so we have to think about all these aspects. Exactly. And, and again, if we are talking about, you, you, you brought again, talking about technology, you just need to evaluate the impact in the entire supply chain. It's not just a partial thing or a narrow thing that we need to look at. You right. also mentioned uh, when I was asking you, Josie, about the complexity of supply chains, you just mentioned one of the uh, basic trade-offs that is in between uh, achieving this high service level and low cost or, or, or do it in a very efficient way, correct? So there are many trade-offs in, in supply chains that uh, companies are dealing with, with them and trying their best in being efficient and at the same time trying to serve their customer uh, or provide the best service to their customers. Um, I want to connect here because Dr. Chris Campley in Supply Chain Fundamentals, he when he covered inventory management and transportation management, always, always at the end of the lesson, he's bringing this trade-off in between cost and service. That is one of the basic trade-offs in supply chain, of course. And I also want to connect here now with e-commerce and omnichannel. We know that retailers like Walmart, Tesco, uh, Target, big retailers, are uh, uh, facing the challenge of combining uh, stores and digital channels. They are trying to serve their customers at the store, at the curbside, home delivery, and offer convenience, quality, value at the same time. So they are dealing with many trade-offs. And I was very positively surprised the other day when I was watching one of the videos of the president of Walmart that he was bringing supply chain playing a key role in, in all of this uh, environment, you know, in this competitive environment, this key role in, or, in order to help uh, the company to be sustainable in all sense, uh, in cost, environment, and from the social perspective, of course. So, and we also know that these fluctuations in inventory uh, create extra costs. And if you are not managing uh, appropriately the, the supply chain, then it's impossible to offer, for example, this seamless customer experience or these fast deliveries at a, at a efficient, in an efficient way. So what are your thoughts here about these trade-offs? What are kind of the most uh, or the most recent challenging trade-offs that you are observing in companies in, in this environment and this dynamic environment? Okay, uh, there are many, many answers to this, but we, maybe we can start with the consumer. Uh, because today, in many products you order from in Boston, from Amazon, you get it in two hours or four hours. Hmm. That is ridiculous. I mean, who needs the product in four hours? We order a product in the evening, it gets at 4 a.m. in the morning, it gets to our door um, so, uh, from Amazon. So it's as long as people click on this and not, you know, uh, yeah. you know, they want it in two hours. They want it for us. Even though Amazon always said it's Amazon day, you can get it in three days, in two days. But it's just so convenient. So there's a big trail off because when you, if Amazon, Amazon has a, you know, a fulfillment center outside Boston. If I order something that they have in a fulfillment center and they get to me in two hours, it's very inefficient. Hmm. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not green at all because they have to send it that uh, um, event directly to my home and, and give it to me. 
Uh, they don't, it takes them an hour just to find it in the warehouse. And then the vent takes another you know, 45 minutes to get to me. So it, it just, there's no, they cannot build an efficient tour, which, uh, which would like. But in, in any aspect of, uh, of supply chain, there's this trade-off. For example, uh, let's say I make some stuff, some widgets, some items, mm -hmm. I, and customers ordering it. What I can do, one way to do it is to put everyone in a FedEx envelope and then they'll get it the next morning. Yeah. Another way is to wait and fill a truck and send it and, and, and send it to the uh, to, to the store. Clearly, sending in one at a time will be a very high level of service. The cost will be enormous. Putting it in a truck, I'd have to wait until I have enough to fill the truck. So I'm sacrificing level of service, but the cost is lower. I, maybe I want to do something in between, something that you will have relatively high level of service and, re and relatively low cost. But we have to think about all, all of these uh, trade-offs uh, along the supply chain. How fast we want it, how, how good the level of service, at what cost are we willing, what is the cost that we are, that we are willing to pay? This goes beyond. I mean, it's a, it, it, it touches on geopolitical issues. It touches on reshoring. Do we want for example, have a, a supplier in China, mm -hmm. uh, which may take time to get to us, but it, it's a low cost, or have a supplier in, in the United States, which may be costlier, but we can get it quickly and it's not subject to problems because if there'll be, if the tension between the US and China will continue to grow, we may have more, more and more problems. So there's the geopolitical aspect. We saw what happened when the Russians uh, invaded Ukraine, that suddenly there was a food problem because Ukraine is a, uh, generates a lot of wheat and a lot of uh, food stuff that, that gets us. So there are nations in, in Africa that, uh, that, that were suffering. Uh, the supply chain of, of oil, when, when Russia cut all the oil and gas, most of the oil and gas shipment to uh, uh, to Europe at the beginning, there was panic until they realized eh, they can adjust. There are lots of adjustments uh, uh, to the supply of oil and gas, and it was not a big deal. And you know, the winter is passing, no problem. But a lot of these things are a question of uh, of trade offs. And give you last example in Europe when when they are very conscientious about green economy about sustainability it used to be until a few you know, until short time ago that the uh, oil and gas were considered you know dirty fuel mm -hmm. Europe just announced that gas is now green come on get, get, surely gas has about half the emissions of um, of gasoline of uh, you know oil but I'm green, really. It's, it's, it's a lot of emission. So, but you see the trade-off. They, yeah. they, they had to agree. Okay, so so the trade-off is not only between cost and cost and service. You've been green and you know uh, supplying energy to uh, to the consumer. There are many many trade-offs. Yeah, definitely. I agree on that. And thanks for bringing even more examples just to illustrate this key aspect of supply chains. And also supply chains, and, and you you brought to us, you no know, geopolitical tensions. There are many aspects that are impacting and um, are intricate systems, um, with many stakeholders, many stakeholders that are involved across many geographies. It's a global problem what we have. Um, I want to connect here with the skills of the supply chain professionals. So, what the skills? Uh, do supply chain professionals need to have in this increasingly complex space? What do you think about that, Yossi? Well, obviously, we teach what we think is important in the, uh, in the MicroMaster and in the programs at, at MIT. But yes. we, we, we go from the fundamental understanding how supply chain work, understanding how the basic components of supply chains are, are working. What's what's involved in inventory management in optimizing inventory, what's involved in transportation management. These are the basic building block of logistics. But we talk also about procurement, we talk about distribution, we talk about all, all, all kinds of related issues. So 
there's a whole level of, um, of knowledge that is just understanding what you have to do as a supply chain manager. What are the basics that you have to do? We do try, even in the MicroMaster, to instill some of these ideas of trade-offs are everywhere. Supply chains are you know, complex system. You have to look at it end to end. They, they interact with other supply chain. They don't, they, they don't stand you know, uh, alone by themselves. How do you deal with, uh, uh, with disruption and unexpected event? So we also go to that, uh, to that length to give students the tool that they need to be successful in their, in their profession. So yeah. I think I'm ha I'm happy to open it to questions if you want. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, yes, um, I, I, a lot of questions in the chat and the Q and A. Yeah, we we are going to go to that in, in just in, in a minute. I need to cover one more thing, but yes, I I with you that uh, in addition to cover these basic concepts in the MicroMaster, the system thinking, the problem solving, the critical thinking is there. And um, supply chain fundamentals. Uh, Dr. Chris Cap is our alma mater in the MicroMaster program. He's definitely been in this trade off since the very beginning. The very first time he's talking about supply chains, he's bringing these trade offs that uh, Professor Yef, Chef is bringing here. So that's important. I just want to bring one more topic because it's one question from Claudia. Um, Claudia Cárdenas and connect very well with, with my point here. Uh, Claudia is asking, in your opinion, how is artificial intelligence going to change the supply chain and our role, the role of supply chain in it? And I think it's a, it's a great question and connects well with this, with the skills we just uh, um, been, have been discussing, Josie, because definitely, uh, you, I know, I know that in your book, you have this dilemma in between, is AI killing jobs or creating new jobs? So I think probably, uh, we have here a very good question from Claudia about the role of AI and how this is going to impact and change our supply chains. Well, okay. Niels Bohr, the famous uh, physicist, famous nuclear physicist, says it's very hard to predict, especially the future. So I will try to predict the future anyway. <laughs> uh, look, in, in, in the new book, here's the is you know my new book. In the new book, I talk a lot about uh, about it. the book is called you know AI and the future of work in the uh, yeah. in the subtitle. And I look at all the industrial evolution, the, the, all and there were always tension. Everybody thought that there would be job losses, uh, mm -hmm. and, and there were by the way, there were job losses. But it, what always happened, there were more jobs created than jobs lost. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and job changed. Some jobs disappear completely. I mean, we don't have elevator operators anymore. We don't have people who use the phone exchange and put the stuff when you, you try to call someone, it's all automated. So some jobs were lost. Um, some jobs were de-skilled. You know, people who use a lot of skill for them now require less skills. Uh, and some jobs were democratized. Think about the, the impact of, um, say spreadsheets it used mm -hmm. to be if you wanted to build a model you have to go to some modeler in your company and write something fortran or algol or god knows all these you know all languages and build a model and took back and forth many times now you just download the data you do it yourself in excel um think about the the impact of chat gpt First of all, you can write code, which means uh -huh. that, uh, managers will be able to write their own code without looking for programmers. Uh, just and, and this will bring immense productivity because you don't have to go back and forth between the person who programs and the person who said, that's not what I meant. I meant something else. The, the, the person who understands the problem will write the code. In terms of uh, writing text, uh, of course, ChatGPT is still very far from perfect. It still makes up data and makes there's a lot of mistakes, but it, it will get better. And the, to me, it's, it's a tool. It's just another tool. So we will stop judging people by how well, let's say, they write prose, but how well they use ChatGPT. And can they look over what ChatGPT created and judge it? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense before they send it to the next, uh, next person? 
I find it myself sometimes very useful in terms of starting to think. So when I look at the, the new subject, yeah, I ask ChatGPT sometimes, I get you know one page of stuff and I say, yeah, that's just garbage. So I try to do something else. I yeah. Have, <laughs> I specify something else. But sometimes I get stuff that is useful and I can start this, start to work from that. So yeah. at the end, I think it's a tool. But let me add one more point about this. In every one of these technological revolution, the problem is as follows. You know the people are going to lose their job because this is the people that you know. They do the, they do the job, they, they, uh, they do the tasks that you know, they do the jobs that you know. They are cashier in the supermarket or whatever. What you don't know is who are the people who will do the new jobs. The, yes. because the jobs don't even exist yet. And you don't yeah. know what's what's required for the new job. But I would say, don't forget that some things that it will be a long time before AI will be able to do. Things like empathy and morals and understanding context and hmm. being able to judge algorithmic results. I think that it will be a long while before AI uh, can do so. People for a long while still have jobs. Yeah. And, and again, the critical thinking you brought before as a as a key a skill is is key here because you need to to have this critical thinking in order to interpret and um, this information that you are receiving. Um, this also connect. Um, as I'm glad that you are bringing this about the new jobs that this new solutions, new technologies are creating at the end of the day. Um, this connect with the uh, uh, recent video from the president of, of, of Walmart. He was talking about the role of automation. Um, he said, okay, automation is going to help customers, associates, and companies' business, of course. Um, and he was asked about, yeah, but less manual labor, of course, less manual labor, but we might need and we are going to need different roles for associates are going to be required. Re new roles are emerging, less manual, and most likely or, or probably better paid jobs because are going to require more skills, some people more qualified in order to be able to, to, to do that. So yeah, this is totally aligned with that. Okay, so um, we have a lot of questions, Josie. Yes, uh, uh, so let's try to bring more questions. I have one question from Remy. Remy, uh, he's uh, saying that uh, in May, in mid May, the European Union uh, is organizing a major conference about beyond growth. And participants will discuss how to achieve sustainable prosperity in the European Union after growth has ended. Um, the, uh, Remy is asking, how can the supply chain support prosperity? rather than material growth. Okay. <laughs> How do you define prosperity? That's the, that's the question. Uh, you know, uh, the European has a vision of industrial, the, the industrial revolution 5.0. It's beyond industry 4.0 because it looks at growth, but sustainable growth and with social justice as well. Um, whether it will work, it's not clear. Honestly, it's not clear. I, it's not clear because the question is, who would invest? Ask yourself, would you invest in a, somebody would come to you and say, you have two possible investments. This, this company will pay you more, will have better margin, you know, higher revenue, lower cost, but it's not going to be that green. And then this company will sacrifice margin for being more green, would you would you invest? Well, the investment community doesn't work this way. They go for the highest margin. So whether the question is, will they be able to have its cake and eat it too? And they have some some ideas on on how to do it. Um, specifically, I you know supply chain have to keep simply being as efficient as possible. Um, but when I mean as efficient as possible, I hope. And the European Union is working on this, on introducing the externalities, emission, for example, into the equation. So the carbon taxes, mm -hmm. various ways of, of, of carbon taxes, because with carbon taxes, it's automatically you will, you will want to use less energy in transportation, in warehousing, in cooling, in, in everything. So it works the economic incentive 
and the sustainability incentive goes hand in hand. But I think it will be something that will be needed to be imposed from above, not something that uh, because the supply chain or a company that will do it on its own will be less competitive. And in fact, the European Union is introducing, you know, border tax because yeah. they, they are always afraid that uh, let's say uh, imports from China who don't have any uh, any regulation will be cheaper. So yeah. they, even by the idea, they admit that without this uh, environmental regulation, product will be cheaper. Yeah. And, and they want to to uh, to maintain the competition. Yeah. So this is a move a move toward it's just like carbon tax. It's aligning the um, economic incentive with the sustainability incentive. So it's once they do it, then supply chain will automatically respond. We don't need to do anything different. Yeah, and different countries are using different incentives, and this is a, yeah, definitely another big topic here. Another question, uh, Colin. Uh, Colin is saying, Professor Sheffy, thank you for the webinar today. In your latest book, The Power of Resilience, I don't think this is the latest. I think this is the previous one. But in any case, The Power, the power of Resilience. The, the, the Power of Resilience is five books ago. But exactly. <laughs> you talk about the challenges with forecasting during a crisis. Can you talk more about the ways you are seeing um, success with supply demand forecasting during a crisis okay let me talk about it because this is tied to one of the to the previous question about the role of technology yeah many companies are using newest technology being you know machine learning and others in order to forecast demand the problem during disruption if it's a big enough disruption there's a a, a structural change in the demand pattern and the algorithms fall apart. We saw it during the pandemic, we saw it during the uh, uh, financial crisis, the, the Fukushima, the algorithms are, are falling flat. They're, they're not, you cannot use them. Also, there are questions, we become more and more dependent on, uh, on uh, digitization, and we are more and more vulnerable to subject uh, to uh, cyber attacks. And we saw how Maersk, for example, mm -hmm. came to a halt during the during the cyber attack. They not even they were not even part of it. It was not directed at them. It was the Russian attacking Ukraine in 2017. Maersk came to a, a total halt. This comes back to um, we talk about AI and jobs. We need people who can still understand the processes and can run it by hand. At the time in Maersk, they were writing manifests by hand instead of uh, with the computer and faxing it to the to the various uh, you know um, custom authorities because the computers didn't work. But lucky, they had enough people who still remember how to do it. Mm -hmm. The question is if we will have generations of people who just not to know how to know it on the computer. The computer does a lot of the calculation. Not only they will not be able to work without a computer, they will not even understand the underlying process. What should be done in the first place, not only how it's done. So companies will have to have a lot of people who understand the process because people by nature are more flexible and understand yeah. the context and understand that they have, you have to do things differently. You have to create new collaboration. You have to create new supply chain on, uh, you know, on the fly. Very hard for algorithm, AI, machine learning, whatever you want to do it. And in the in the foreseeable future, I don't think it will be uh, it will be possible. So we still need a lot of people to do it. Yeah. Understanding the processes and again connecting the dots because you need to connect the dots with all of the implications. We have one one question from Javier. Javier is saying, I'm a supply chain professional with more than 15 years of experience. What should I do to be a relevant contributor to the supply chains of the future? So maybe I can take this one and you come jump in. You, you take it, yes. Yes, I would say, Javier, connect with lifelong learning opportunities. There are great opportunities now. Online education is, is helping a lot to full-time professionals because uh, are very affordable, are very flexible, convenient. You can learn from, from videos uh, whenever you want, during the nights, during the weekends. So I think these online and asynchronous courses are very, very helpful. We are, we are offering not only the 
MicroMaster, we are also offering custom courses for companies like Walmart, Sears, Robinson, and the, the associates are finding this very helpful in order to just to learn and, and keep them up to date um, with new tools and techniques uh, and just to bring these to their, to their company. So just uh, um, wanted to add that. I, uh, I, I, yes. Let me, just, let me just add something that it's not only our course online, the other courses online, but it's also going to conferences, going to meeting with people, understanding what other companies are doing, uh, to try to get yourself into lectures and, and presentations about new technology. So at least you understand what's what, uh, what's coming. The the death the death nail of uh, of people is just if you don't keep developing, you must develop yourself. Keep developing all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and conference is a great source also to keep you updated. Um, yeah, definitely. So one question, this is more a specific question from Danny Vasquez. Uh, he said, of course, thank you for the insightful meeting, wonderful points. Ah, he is highlighting the instant, instant gratification and the risk about a um, cost for satisfying uh, those instant gratification demands. Uh, he's asking, what are your thoughts on drone delivery service uh, that satisfy delivery within hours with, without using typical modes of transportation? Yeah, it's a very specific question about last mile delivery, sure. but we, we have the, the, the lab here, the last mile delivery lab. We actually, lab, so. we actually yes. work on this. There's a, one of my colleagues, Matthias Winkenbach, is working exactly with a company uh, we have an actual company who are doing experiments with uh, vans that are moving and the vans can send drones to, to do the, uh, uh, the home delivery. At this point, as you know, there are many, many regulatory hurdles uh, on, on this. It's not clear the drone can fly freely and drop bombs on, on, on houses or, uh, or come down. But it is happening, by the way. It is happening already in large part of the dark. A sparsely populated like Africa. There's a company that does drone delivery of medical supplies. Uh, so there are, there are companies who do, who do it already. But it, as I said, the, Dr. Winkenbach is here is trying to do it, trying to see how it can be done in urban areas. Uh, maybe not in New York City, but in, in suburbs when you can come to a specific home. I don't see how you can put it in, a, in the window on the 21st floor in, uh, on Fifth Avenue. But uh, it can be done in a, in a suburb, too, possibly. In terms of instant gratification, <laughs> we have instant gratification already now. So just this is just another mode of creating instant gratification. Maybe if the uh, drones are electric drones, and, and I hope they are just for the, for the noise that they create, if they are not electric drones. So, um, Many of them will be will be electric, so maybe it will be a more efficient way to get instant gratification. Of course, mm -hmm. the main question is why do you need instant gratification? In, in, yeah, and that's part of education and just thinking about about the issue. It's just, uh, but by I, the way, government can step in. Government yeah. can step in and outlaw less than two day delivery, or less than, unless it's a medical supply or unless it's exactly. something that you. Threatening but, life. Come on. For it's, which type of product do you really need this instant gratification? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, let me connect now. I'm going to combine two very good questions just to, to, to end the, the event. One from Bogdan. He's asking about what is your stance on technology? Are we going to share uh, or to see companies sharing data end to end uh, and collaborating? This is a great question. And I'm going to combine this with Pamela question so you can uh, answer both at the same time because she's also bringing the importance of supply chain security in terms of the data in order to achieve technological advan advantage. So yeah, data privacy and data sharing among different actors in the supply chain is the question. But it's, uh, it's, uh, if I understand, it's not so much data privacy, it's data security. The co uh, company wants to keep their data. Um, as people who were listening to, uh, to our latest, last week we had, the, uh, we had a conference and one of the speakers was 
trying to put together a whole group of companies to create better forecasting and, and better cooperation. And the main problem is the lawyers get involved and data sharing. And the whole idea is to share data uh, without sharing prices, but just sharing, you know, uh, total amounts of, uh, of product ordered and, and product received. It's a, it's a big problem. We are living in a competitive society and it's uh, companies are hesitating. They, they do it on the margin with companies that they trust. Uh, look, along the supply chain, people do share data. Companies do share data with the customers and, and suppliers. The suppliers do share data. But if you're talking about making a big change, you need a, what's called a horizontal data sharing. So companies are even competing with each other we share, we share data so we can get a better picture of demand, of supply, of what's going on in the marketplace. Because especially when, when something happens, when there's a disruption, companies start over-ordering and we have what's called phantom orders because they know that suppliers have to allocate and give, I don't know, 50% for each. So they multiply the order that they get, you know, a higher number and it's not real, real order. So security, of course, uh, companies are not willing to share because knowing the data is a competitive advantage. And, you know, my data, uh, people know how much I order, how much I don't order, what's going on, uh, how do I keep inventory, people can use it against me. So, uh, so companies are not, not easily sharing data. Yes, they are not. So Yossi, with more, almost 400 people attending live, as you can imagine, we have many more questions, but uh, yes, we are running out of time. So I really wanted to say thank you for a very insightful talk and sharing your experience with our uh, program, with our learners. Um, and thank you so much for bringing all of your experience here today. Thanks also to the audience for great questions. It has been a pleasure to host this event. Um, if you want to be in touch with us, just reach out to us and we will be happy to answer your emails. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josie, once again. Sure.